Well, I am here to talk about Silas Weir Mitchell, and most of you probably know him as the evil doctor in Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. If you've read that book or seen the exhibit, he did treat her during her 1887 rest cure unsuccessfully. She didn't really enjoy the cure at all. And he was also the inventor of the so-called rest cure for nervous women. So um, he was he devised this particular treatment. And he was a very prominent Philadelphia neurologist and novelist. Yes, he was also a novelist. He wrote something like 13 novels. He was, if nothing else, a very, very busy man. So he accomplished quite a lot in his fairly long lifetime. He was born in 1829, died in 1914. Didn't really get to see much of the First World War, but that's probably a good thing. Um, so Mitchell's reputation today is kind of bifurcated. Among neuroscientists, he has a reputation of being one of the greats. He's a medical hero. He's the father of American neurology based on his work on nerve injuries during and after the Civil War, particularly his work on phantom limb pain, which was really groundbreaking. But among literary critics such as myself and some cultural historians, Mitchell has been seen as a medical misogynist because of the way he treated Gilman and some of her uh, contemporaries using the rest cure. Um, so really different reputations among these two groups. Um, when I first went to the College of Physicians of Philadelphia to look at his medical archives, I was expecting to find the correspondence and diaries of a medical villain, of an evil genius, but it wasn't really like that at all. He's much more of a complex individual than that. Um, I also want to say that he wrote a ton of fiction which almost no one reads or critiques today, and I think that's a shame. Um, I think especially people should be reading The Case of George Dedlow, the short story very graphic, very interesting. I think you would really enjoy it, especially as medical students. Okay, so the question I want to ask today is Mitchell, medical hero or medical misogynist? And of course, the true answer is yes, he was both. <laughs> but it's even more complicated than that. Um, I wanted to pose the question because I think the traveling exhibit that you guys have seen cast him more in the latter light as a villain, but he, he did do a lot of interesting things that he deserves to be remembered for. So I want to talk about his research first. Um, this talk will be divided sort of into two parts with a third kind of interspersed throughout. Um, the first is Mitchell as medical researcher, why neurologists love him, in other words, um, his work up to and during the Civil War. The second part is his later and slightly less reputable part of his career, his rest care for nervous women, and the alternative, the West Cure for Nervous Men, which was a lot more fun. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about his novels, his 13 novels, his short stories, his poetry. That's going to be interspersed in little bits and pieces throughout the talk. So first of all, Mitchell as medical researcher. Well, he um, was not the best student early in life. He was a late bloomer by his own admission. So he studied medicine at the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, quite a respectable school nowadays, but back then, if you were really a hot shot, you went to UPenn or Harvard or somewhere like that. So um, he wasn't the strongest student starting out, but he decided to rectify this once he had discovered his passion for science by spending six months in Paris after graduation studying with Claude Bernard, who was known as the father of physiology. And um, Bernard was an early proponent of the scientific method in medicine, which back then they didn't really do that all the time, so that was important. His work was based on a lot of experimentation with live animals, which was also unusual in medicine at the time, and it really influenced Mitchell's medical research. He would in turn use a ton of live animals in his researches, which put him very much ahead of the curve in America back then. Um, America was kind of a medical backwater in 1850, if you really wanted to study medicine seriously, you went to the continent. So that's why Mitchell spent those six months with Claude Bernard in France. He also did another rather interesting thing in Paris. He learned, he came into a little bit of money. So he purchased a very high-end microscope, which that in and of itself put him at the cutting edge, the forefront of medicine in his time. Um, because not a lot of US physicians had microscopes. Not a lot of physicians anywhere had microscopes. This was a new thing. This was a big deal. Um, so when Mitchell took over his medical practice, or the family medical practice from his father in 1858, he was ready to take a cutting edge look at medical care and also to carry out some scientific research of his own. 
In his spare time, he conducted a number of scientific experiments in addition to carrying on a full medical practice. And I mean, this man kept crazy hours. Like he'd stay up till one or two in the morning and get up at five or six. And he just really was passionate about his research and really wanted to make time for that um, with very little reward. I mean, he wasn't being paid for this. It was just his own interest. So one of the interesting things he did prior to the Civil War was he published Researches on the Venom of the Rattlesnake in 1860. And this was the first of approximately 15 articles on rattlesnakes that he wrote. He was really fascinated by the snakes and their venom. And um, he, this is where he really put his training with Claude Bernard to good use because he sacrificed hundreds of animals in this research, probably more than he technically needed to. But in addition to the rattlesnakes, he had smaller animals that he would have the rattlesnakes bite, and then he would observe the effects of the venom. And he was also rather hands-on himself. Um, he, in fact, tasted the rattlesnake venom at one point just to see what it felt like on the tongue. So he just had to be involved himself in whatever way he could. Um, he also liked to test new experimental substances on himself. Um, he's kind of known for this in some circles. But he took mescal buttons or hallucinogenic mushrooms and described his experiences before the American Neurological Society. So he was taking drugs, but he was doing it for science. So, <laughs> and that wasn't really all that usual back then. I think William James did something similar. So these medical men, they love to try new substances and describe the effects just to see what they did. Um, so the Civil War was really when he did the most, the bulk of his scientific research but this was also a time of great upheaval for Mitchell. He lost his wife to diphtheria and his younger brother to the war during these years. But it was also the occasion of his greatest discoveries. So Mitchell served as a surgeon at Turner's Lane Hospital, which was an army hospital for soldiers suffering from nerve injury and disease. And this place had the greatest um, collection of strange nerve injuries that you could, you've ever seen in your life or anyone had ever seen in anyone's lifetime. So he really had a field for discovery there. I mean, in a way, he was just a man in the right place at the right time. But he was also a very observant person. And in 1864, he and his Turner's Lane colleagues co-authored Gunshot Wounds and Other Injuries of Nerves, which is now widely considered a medical classic. And he later revised and republished this as Injuries of the Nerves and Their Consequences in 1872. So this is really the work on which his neurological reputation rests. It's still seen as very good and very um, contemporary in terms of the way he describes nerve wounds. Um, in particular, he's known for his meticulous descriptions of phantom limb pain. And you probably know what that is, but in case you don't, it's when um, an amputee experiences pain in an amputated limb. So you're missing an arm, but you still feel pain in the hand or the elbow or something like that. And he studied that very intensively. And he, other he also described other consequences of damage to nerve tissue, such as codalgia, which is burning pain. And um, he was very detailed in his descriptions. So for neurologists, this is really the basis of his lasting claim to fame. Um, at Turner's Lane, Mitchell said, the cases were of amazing interest. Here at one time were 80 epileptics, every kind of nerve wound, palsies, singular choreas, and stump disorders. That hospital was, as one poor fellow said, a hell of pain. So as you can well imagine, a Civil War um, military hospital ward was a place where a lot of people were in great agony. It was not an easy place to be. But Mitchell made absolutely the most of it that he possibly could and wrote down everything that he was seeing. Um, and the reason for such terrible injuries during the Civil War was advances in weaponry, including Minie bullets and early, um, early machine guns. And these mini-A bullets were very soft. So they would break apart upon entering human tissue and cause tons of debilitating nerve injuries. So here's a scene that Mitchell would have likely seen every day in his clinic. These are wounded Union soldiers in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And one thing I think is great about Mitchell is he didn't just write about what he saw in the clinic in scientific works. He also wrote fiction about what he saw in the clinic. So, um, for instance, he wrote The Case of George Dedlow in 1866, and this was a short story that was based on his wartime experiences with nerve-injured soldiers. It was published in the Atlantic Monthly. Um, it was a great success, and it details the experiences of a fictional quadruple amputee during the Civil War. 
Now, just to tell you this, um, there were no quadruple amputees during the Civil War. They didn't have good enough surgical techniques, um, so people were really lucky to survive one or even two amputations like this poor fellow here. Um, it was very unusual, and I don't think it would have ever happened that you would have seen a quadruple amputee. Oddly enough, nowadays that has happened with the Iraq wars um, and the Middle East wars recently, and there's at least five, possibly more, quadruple amputees in America, but um, at this time there were none. So this is a totally fictional situation. And anyway, the hero, Union Army Surgeon George Dedlow, loses his limbs to battle an infection until he is, quote, nothing but a useless torso, more like some strange larval creature than anything of human shape. So Mitchell really wanted to explore what does it mean to a man when he's literally a fraction of his former self, because he loses all his limbs. So the minor characters in the story are really great, too, because they showcase all of the weird diseases that Mitchell was seeing at his clinic. So um, all sorts of nerve injuries and things like St. Vitus's dance, paralysis, causalgia, the minor characters depict very realistically what it would be like to have those conditions. And so realistic was Mitchell's tale that some readers actually tried to visit the fictional protagonist at the Philadelphia Stump Hospital, which was his euphemism for Turner's Lane, and they tried to donate money to the hospital and they tried to donate money to the fictional protagonist. But unfortunately, since he did not exist, they could not donate money. But that just shows you how realistic Mitchell's tale was. People thought this was a real man. Um, one thing I think is really cool about this, as someone who myself does medical humanities work, is he's not just writing as a scientist. He is exploring patient experience. What it might have been like to be a Union Army soldier who lost all four limbs. I mean, gosh, why not explore that? Um, and his, his fictional writing was sometimes in advance of his scientific writing. For instance, it's in the story, not in his science, where he first describes phantom limb syndrome. So here's a case where his fiction was in advance of his science. I think that's really interesting. And another thing that's interesting about this is Mitchell posits a neurological, not psychological, cause for phantom limb pain. So many doctors at the time would have said, you know, so if your limb's cut off and you're feeling phantom limb pain, that's in your imagination. You're being hysterical because you have no limb. How could you feel pain there? But Mitchell said, no, that's a real neurological phenomenon because if the limb has been cut off improperly and the nerve tissue damaged, you can definitely still feel nerve pain in an absent hand and an absent arm. So he posited a neurological, not a psychological cause for this pain. And this scene here just shows you some of the many Civil War amputees. Amputation was very, very common during the Civil War, but again, there were no quadruple amputees, mostly single amputations. Um, so the Civil War is really, really important to Mitchell in his whole life, in his whole works. Um, after the war ended, Mitchell was so traumatized by what he had seen in the wards and with his family that he experienced a physical and mental breakdown. He had to go to Europe for a while to you know, have some spa cures and enjoy himself and, and rebuild his health. Um, and then he revisits the Civil War again and again in his novels, all of which were written in the 1880s and after, so long after the Civil War was over. But five of those 13 novels are set during the Civil War. So that tells you psychologically he never really got over it. He had to keep reprocessing these experiences. And finally, on his deathbed, Mitchell imagined that he was back at the Battle of Gettysburg treating wounded soldiers, which he actually did because they needed surgeons desperately to treat the soldiers at Gettysburg. And apparently this left such an impression on him that in his dying you know, delusions and ravings, he imagined that he was doing this. So the Civil War really had a huge impact on him. Okay, next I want to talk a little about the less reputable part of Mitchell's career that neurologists don't give him much credit for the uh, rest care for nervous women and the West care for nervous, went, nervous men. And in a way, this whole part of his career was sort of a happy accident or unhappy accident, depending how you look at it. Um, Mitchell actually developed the major components of the rest care during the Civil War. So for these men with nerve injuries, not much can be done or, other than giving them like morphine or something like that. So he would um, try rest, a high calorie diet, massage and electricity to stimulate resting muscle tissue. And, um, you know, with enough time, these men would rebuild their nerve tissue just through rest and, and feeding. That's what he hoped. 
Um, and eight years later, when he was dealing with a similarly um, rather hopeless class of patients, he decided to return to the same methods and see if it would work. And these hopeless patients were nervous women who were thin, they had been to every doctor and nobody could help them and they were sort of recalcitrant cases. And so he tried this with them and apparently had some success. Um, and he started working in 1871 at the Philadelphia Orthopedic Hospital and Infirmary for Nervous Diseases. And this is where he first came across such women. And that same year, 1871, he wrote a little book called Wear and Tear with Hints for the Overworked. And this book was about neurasthenia, which is a fashionable nervous disorder of the 19th and early 20th centuries. The symptoms were very capacious. They could include depression, fatigue, anxiety, uh, everything we now class under, or Freud would class under the neurotic illnesses, right? Plus um, insomnia, headaches, all kinds of physical symptoms. In one of the early books on neurasthenia, the description of symptoms is eight pages long. So anyone could have neurasthenia and potentially, but these were people who seriously had it. And this book, Wear and Tear, sold very well, and Mitchell was really surprised by this. He just sort of dashed it off in a week or two and thought nothing of it, and all of a sudden it was just selling like hotcakes, and he was an overnight celebrity, and he thought, how did this happen? I wrote gunshot wounds, I wrote injuries of the nerves based on painstaking research over many years, and all of a sudden for this little tract on how not to overwork yourself, he gets famous overnight. So just, he was as surprised by that as anyone else, I think. But that definitely shaped his future career. <clears throat> so Mitchell was interested in, in neurasthenia because he repeatedly suffered from it, including around the time he wrote Wear and Tear in 1871. He had a bout with grave insomnia and other symptoms. And neurasthenia was a popular disease of the day that was first described by neurologist George Miller Beard in 1869. Beard, who was another American neurologist, theorized that neurasthenia had somatic causes. So if you're depressed, it's not because of some, um, something that happened to you, it's because of lack of energy or nerve force in your body. Your body is like a drained down electric battery that needs to be recharged. That was Beard's philosophy, and that was the basis of the rest cure, was trying to rebuild that lost energy within the body. And neurasthenia was associated with the rapid industrialization and urbanization of Gilded Age America. So it was thought, you know, people just can't keep pace with, with change and how fast it's going, and that's why they're getting sick. Of course, if that were true, we'd all have neurasthenia because we have cell phones and we, have, we can fly, not just go on trains. Like, the logic of it doesn't really make sense, but, um, you know, to them, it, it did. And uh, so neurasthenia allegedly had this somatic basis, a lack of energy. So the cure had to be something physical in nature. It couldn't be something like talk therapy. It had to deal with the body. So hence Mitchell's res regimen of rest and overfeeding, which was intended to, to restore a patient's depleted energy reserves. And it's important to keep in mind that uh, the rest cure is associated with women, but that's not who it was originally used on. Mitchell's first rest cure patients were men, actually. They were Civil War patients who experienced different elements of the rest cure, not the whole thing. Um, and Mitchell, even after the war, he did treat numerous men. So it's important to remember that the rest cure was not always done on women, nor was it originally developed for them. Yes? So what class, like if you're not class, could you get the Yes, well, it was associated with the upper classes. That's a very good question. So if you were wealthy, you were more likely to have neurasthenia. If you were poor and exhibited the same symptoms, you were likely to be diagnosed with hysteria. If you were a woman, or maybe overwork, or something to that effect. I mean, it was not a disorder restricted to the wealthy, but it was more often associated with the wealthy. Um, and Mitchell was pretty good about treating cases that came to him, um, the people who came to him without money and needed treatment. He was good about seeing them too, but he might have given them a different diagnosis than he gave the poor people. So that's a very good question, and it's very important that neurasthenia is associated with the upper classes, as we'll see. Um, so Mitchell first used the rest cure to treat a case of locomotor ataxia in 1873. This was the full rest cure with all of its elements, not just some as he had used during the Civil War. 
And locomotor ataxia is a complication of syphilis. Um, but he first described the whole cure in 1877 in the book called Fat and Blood and How to Make Them. And yes, that is really the title. <laughs> and he was literally trying to describe how to get women to gain weight and become less anemic. So hence the logic there. Um, the book describes how to treat nervous women who, as a rule, are thin and lack blood. And the treatment involves six to eight weeks of enforced bed rest, along with a very heavy diet, massage, electrical stimulation and muscles to ensure that the resting muscles didn't atrophy because you're not using them. So Fat and Blood is a fascinating read, very deeply misogynist and disturbing, but also deeply interesting. <clears throat> okay, so Mitchell wrote, a gain in fat up to a certain point seems to go hand in hand with a rise in all other essentials of health. So obviously he wasn't li living in our day and age where obesity is a common problem, right? These women he was seeing were really, they tended to be really thin. Um, they tended to need to gain weight. And just to give you a sense of how much weight they gained, I included some before and after pictures here, where you can see the before picture, the woman is probably anorexic, looks very, very gaunt. And she's gained maybe 40 or 50 pounds in the later picture, and she really does look healthier. So for some women, you know, it could be a really good thing. But the problem with this cure was that Mitchell tended to look at a woman's appearance and say, okay, you're fat enough now, you're cured, you're fine. Um, you've started menstruating again, so you're healthy, um, regardless of what she might say about her physiological or her psychological state. So for instance, the narrator in um, the yellow wallpaper tells her husband she's still feeling anxious, and he says, well, but you've gained flesh and you've gained color, so I'm not worried about you anymore. And that's kind of how Mitchell was too. And um, his really most successful case studies would end with a woman going off, getting married, carrying a child to term, because this was considered like the epitome of what you could achieve if you were truly cured. He was very um, old fashioned in his views on gender, as you can see. Um, so the bed rest, they were serious about this, six to eight weeks. You couldn't even get out of bed to use the bathroom. You know, they had bed pants for that. And you had to even ask the doctor's permission to sit up or turn over. So you were really stuck in that bed. The patient also could not read, so feed herself or have contact with friends or family during this time. I think that sounds awfully boring, but apparently some people liked it. I don't really know why. But another thing Mitchell insisted on is no family could be there during the rest cure. Um, in this Gilded Age America time period, um, people tended to be cared for at home by family members rather than in a hospital by nurses. And Mitchell said, you need a trained nurse. You can't have the family in there humoring the patient's every whim. You need a trained nurse who's going to be firm and helpful. So that, I mean, he really supported the nursing profession in some ways because he was insistent that every patient needed a nurse. So the diet, it's pretty outrageous. Um, a typical daily menu included a light breakfast, a mutton chop as a midday dinner, bread and butter three times a day, along with three or four pints of milk. And as you can imagine, this caused some side effects. Um, they had to have iron supplements too for um, the anemia, <laughs> doses of strychnine and arsenic as nerve tonics. We now know them to be poisons, but they were thought to be nerve tonics, and cod liver oil to treat the attendant constipation that would inevitably come with such a diet. As you can well imagine, um, it's a lot of meat and a lot of milk. So patients would also be given one pound of raw beef in the form of raw soup. This is made by chopping up one pound of raw beef, placing it in a bottle with one pint of water and five drops of strong hydrochloric acid. So he was basically feeding patients like a blood-like mixture, like treating them like vampires, which I think is a little bit crazy. Um, but that's what he really did. And patients who refused this diet might be force-fed through the nose or rectum or rarely whipped to ensure obedience. So he was serious about beef and discipline. <laughs> <laughs> so Mitchell saw some women, the reason for the discipline was that Mitchell saw some women as malingerers who faked their illness to avoid unpleasant household duties. And now, I think that's rather unfair of him, but he had his reasons, we will see. Um, such women were typically diagnosed as hysterical as opposed to neurasthenic. 
Now, interestingly, Charlotte Perkins Gilman herself, he diagnosed her as hysterical, even though she had what we would now call postpartum depression, I think. So that might be one reason that her cure was a failure, was that you know, he classed her with this group of patients to whom he was notoriously unsympathetic. He didn't really like the hysterics as much as he liked some of the other patients. And he said they were in need of, quote unquote, moral medications. They had a moral problem. Yes? So just because I'm not as familiar with very old diagnosis, but um, what's the difference between higher hysterical and neurasthetic? Like, what, why would he consider one to be the size of their class? That was a great question and very fuzzy boundary. Class was one factor, so was emotiveness. So um, a neurasthenic was a stoic person who kept it to themselves. A hysteric was someone who was wailing and flailing and, you know, really making a show of their emotions. That tended to be the main difference. Um, and I think it's kind of a false distinction, but the diagnoses back then were a little fuzzier. They're still fuzzy, but they're, they were even fuzzier back then. Very good question. Um, so he compared such women to men who had faked illness to shirk service in the Civil War. And unfortunately, this was, this was something he saw a lot of at Turner's Lane, and he and his colleagues had been very skilled at detecting and punishing such men. For instance, maybe they'd give them like latrine duty or something to make them more motivated to return to the front. So when he saw women who he thought were overly emotive, hysterical, exaggerating their symptoms, he said, well, maybe this will motivate you to, this rest cure will motivate you to go back home and take care of the kids like you should be doing. So he even admitted in fat and blood, the rest I like for female invalids is not at all their notion of rest, to lie abed half the day and sew a little and read a little and be interesting and excite sympathy is all very well. But when they are bidden to stay in bed a month and neither to read, write, nor sew, and to have one nurse who is not a relative, then rest becomes for some women a rather bitter medicine, and they are glad enough to accept the order to rise and go about. So he's remarkably honest about the punitive function that the rest cure could have for some women, not for all. Um, so in his fiction, he provides a vivid picture of such malingering hysterical invalids as he saw them. In his 1886 novel, Roland Blake, for example, Mitchell portrays a couch-loving invalid, Octopia Darnell, whose name comes from her clingy nature. She liked to, you know, grab and hold on to her relatives and drain them of energy. And she has the singular pale golden complexion of a woman originally dark-skinned and now lacking blood. So that anemic, you know, pale skin combination, thin, that he usually saw in his patients. And Octopia is very clingy and drains the time and energy of those around her. So um, particularly, she exerts a damaging influence on her relatives, including a young cousin named Olivia, who's pictured at left. Um, Mitchell writes, the exactions of her nervous, sickly cousin were surely sapping the life of the younger woman. And Octopia's demands include a longing for kisses and physical petting from her cousin. So there's kind of this lesbian overtone, an incest overtone to this story. And um, I thought that was rather crazy when I first read it, but they did associate lesbianism with neurasthenia and with hysteria back then. So if you were a woman who had a mental health condition and you exhibited signs of lesbianism, that might have been connected, the two might have been seen as connected. And maybe that's why Mitchell was so insistent on a nurse because he was afraid of this lesbian activity breaking out amongst the patients and their caretakers. I know that sounds crazy, but it is a theme running through fat and blood. It's a very important theme. Um, so Mitchell wrote at length about the danger of nursing invalids like this. He said, it is the self-sacrificing and overcareful sympathy of a mother, a sister, or some other devoted relative. Nothing is more curious, nothing more sad and pitiful than these partnerships between the sick and selfish and the sound and overloving. By slow but sure degrees, the healthy life is absorbed in the sick life, the nurse falls ill, and a new victim is found. I have seen a hysterical, anemic girl kill in this way three generations of nurses. So he's very, very negative towards these women, and he also compared sick women to vampires. So I just think he had been reading too much gothic fiction. That's my take on this, honestly. I think he was being, he's getting a little crazy there. Um, he also might have just gotten very fed up with these insolence after a while, because, you know, people when they're sick are very needy. 
as I'm sure med students already know. Or if you don't know, you will soon find out sick people are very, very needy. But he shouldn't have taken his anger out on them in this way, clearly. Um, so was the rest cure effective? Uh, why did people do this at all, right? I think it was effective if you were severely underweight. Um, you would gain 40 to 50 pounds sometimes. So if you were really desperately underweight, it could be a good thing, I guess. Um, it was also a relatively benign alternative to the treatments that were offered in the day, including institutionalization, or hysterectomy and ovariotomy. Um, it was thought then that a woman's uh, reproductive organs were intimately connected with her mental health. So if you're having problems with depression or anxiety, maybe if you just remove the uterus, the woman will be fine. This was the logic back then. Um, and uh, to his credit, Mitchell did not do this. He thought these surgeries were a very bad idea. So to the extent that the rest cure was replacing these other treatments, I think it was a good thing. Um, at least that can be said for it, for sure. And believe it or not, some, some women actually liked Mitchell's cure, which I think is a little strange. But including some intellectual women, such as Amelia Gear Mason, who was an author, and she described his cure as autocratic but effective. And interestingly, she went on to be good friends with Mitchell for 30 years, and they wrote each other over 200 letters. It's a very reciprocated friendship. They were really um, good friends. And later, author Rebecca Harding Davis, who wrote Life in the Iron Mills, a brilliant short story, which I think you should read, she wrote, I owe Mitchell much to him, life, and what is better than life. And still other women admired Mitchell for his literary and medical celebrity. And they would go to him just to be like, I have a famous doctor. This is so cool. He talks to me, too. It's like really exciting. So there was some people watching aspect to this cure that I think some people liked. Um, and it's important to note that Mitchell did become friends with some patients. And he even encouraged some women to write. Uh, Gilman writes that for her, he said she should never touch pen or pencil again as long as she lived. But that was not the advice he gave to everybody, um, including uh, there's a legend that has it that uh, when Edith Wharton went to get a rest cure with Mitchell in 1898, a four-month rest cure, which is really long, um, he encouraged her to write novels. And so maybe we owe him such masterpieces as The House of Mirth or The Age of Innocence. Um, I don't know for sure if that's true, but there's a popular legend that says so. Um, of course, some women hated the rest cure, and I understand why, because it sounds very boring. Um, Jane Addams, who was the founder of Whole House in Chicago, she really missed reading during her 1882 cure. I, I see a hand raised back there. Do you have, are there any theories about why he wouldn't specifically request, suggested that Gilman? Not writing anymore? Was it because her writing was subversive or just because he thought that for her as a patient it was unhealthy? There are some thoughts about that, and I think one reason is because he thought she was hysterical. And hysterical women he thought were already too emotive and too demonstrative, so they needed to cut back on expressing their feelings. Maybe a neurasthenic woman, by contrast, would be encouraged to write. But she also introduced herself in a way that he didn't like. She wrote him a long letter describing her family history and everyone who had been sick and what she'd experienced. And he saw this as like arrogance, like, who are you to write me this long letter? Don't write anymore, you know? So I think maybe that was part of it as they got off on the wrong foot. He didn't really like her. He diagnosed her as hysteric. hysteric and so maybe that's why he told her not to write. So that is a really good question. Um, Virginia Woolf also hated the rest cure. She was given the rest cure many times in her native Britain in the early 20th century. And the reason she hated rest so much, I think, is because although she was diagnosed as a neurasthenic, she was really manic depressive, people think. And during a manic phase, I can only imagine it would be torture to have to lie down for six to eight weeks. So I can well imagine why she hated the rest cure and why it became such a horrible thing for her. And she depicts um, a rest cure so well, she talks about the rest cure in her novel, Mrs. Dalloway, from 1925. And in it, a shell-shocked veteran, interestingly a man, decides to commit suicide in order to avoid a rest cure, because he's just so, so desperately against it. And it's also thought that Virginia Woolf might have committed suicide in the 1940s for that reason as well, because she wanted to avoid yet another rest cure. 
she was having another bout of depression, did not want to undergo the treatment. So that's not for sure, but some people speculate that's why she did kill herself. Um, the rest cure was also horrible if you've had a real somatic disease and were mistakenly diagnosed as neurasthenic, which still happens today. I mean, you can go to a doctor and they say it's all in your head, you're just depressed, and you might really have something else. Um, a good example of this is Mitchell's patient, Winifred Howells. She was the daughter of a very prominent author named William Dean Howells, who's the editor of the Atlantic Monthly. Um, and she died while being forced fed during her rest cure. And this was a terrible tragedy. Uh, Mitchell did an autopsy and he said she had actually had an organic disease all along and he hadn't known it. He didn't say what it was, but presumably she would have died anyway. But I can only imagine this was a bad way to go. This was not the way you would have wanted to spend your last days if you had the choice. And William Dean Howells was friends with Mitchell and the two remained friends afterwards but he was instrumental in getting the yellow wallpaper published, which I think is very interesting and very telling. Um, I guess he, he read it, he really encouraged Gilman to send it to the Atlantic, and they didn't accept it, but um, then he helped her find another journal that did. So he was very, very much interested in getting the story published, and I think Winifred's death must have had something to do with that. Um, so nervous men had a lot more options. They could have the rest cure if they wanted it, um, but in such cases they were usually given more freedom. For example, Mr. P.D. described in Fat and Blood, who was allowed to be out of bed once a day for four hours and spend one at his place of business. So he could even, to a limited extent, keep up his career while he was undergoing his cure. But other men didn't want to do this, and they were sent west to recover their health through rugged outdoor activity, camping, fishing, cattle roping, rough riding with other men out in the West. And um, that sounds like more fun than the rest cure to me, and many of them really liked it. Um, so many famous men were treated with this cure, including uh, the painter Thomas Aikens, future U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, and poet Walt Whitman, and also, interestingly, the inventor of the, of the Western as a genre. Owen Wister, who was a friend of Mitchell's, was sent west and wrote the first Western, The Virginian, kind of based on his experiences. So we owe that whole genre of the Western to Mitchell and the West here, ironically. Um, and these were often men who were not only neurasthenic, but sometimes men who were thought to be gay. So I kind of wonder about what kind of male bonding was going on out there <laughs> in the prairie and the mountains and all that. Um, and I also think it makes sense that most men returning from the West Cure reported that they really enjoyed it. You know, they felt invigorated, they were physically fit. Um, and one thing to note about the West Cure is that it did reinforce traditional gender norms. In this case, men were sent out to be active to recover, whereas women were put to bed and kept in the home. So both cures really were, were gender traditional, you could say, um, but the cure for men sounds like a lot more fun. Um, I, I want to talk about what happened to the rest cure. Why don't we do this anymore? I think there's a lot of reasons. You know, maybe people are less enthusiastic about weight gain or milk or meat or something. But also, Mitchell's understanding was based on a somatic belief that mental disease came from the body, right? It was due to low energy reserves. Um, and then Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung around the turn of the 20th century changed that paradigm by pioneering a psychological understanding of mental conditions um, as effects of past trauma. So in other words, if you're depressed, Freud and Jung would say it's due to something that happened to you in your childhood. It's not due to low energy levels or something like that. Um, so the rest cure came to seem old fashioned because why would you need a physical cure for a psychological illness? And this shift occurred gradually during the first few decades of the 20th century. Um, I think interestingly, now the pendulum has swung back again, and we've returned to Mitchell's point of view that um, mental illness is somatic in nature. Although now we think of it as the result of some undefined neurological problem, generally we don't know, but I think um, we understand, for example, depression to be sometimes the result of chemical imbalance, and there are other theories, but we're coming to a greater understanding of neurology causing mental illness, not necessarily past trauma, although that can also play a role, of course. Um, thankfully, bed rest is no longer the treatment of choice, 
but it is still prescribed for complicated pregnancies. And I think that's interesting that the one place I know of that the um, that bed rest still exists in medicine is where, you know, it's women, it's to do with women's gynecological problems. And that's where we still use it. So not much has changed in that regard. Um, I want to end with a sort of controversial question. I recognize this is controversial, but how much are we different from Mitchell? How much have we progressed? Because like Mitchell and his contemporaries, we think mental illness has a physical basis. We treat it with drugs instead of rest, but that's still a physical cure. And women still make up the majority of patients. Just to give you one statistic, around 20 to 25% of US women are currently taking a prescription antidepressant, and that's 2.5 times the rate of men. So if you think about that, we're still treating women as guinea pigs or as sort of you know, our, our, cases, our typical cases of mental illness. So things have changed, but maybe not enough. So I just want to leave you with that, and also with this list of sources for further reading. Um, many of them are very short and very interesting articles about the rest cure. So thank you.